Well, good afternoon. We will uh, begin. I think there must be some connection <coughs> between longevity and the weather. <laughs> uh, this uh, particular session uh, was moved from the winter time. It's the only session in about three years, I think, that we've had to uh, cancel because of snowstorm. And today it's raining and people perhaps a little bit slow in coming. But I would point out there are every week, there are between two and 400 people at NIH uh, who are watching this live. And then two to three days later, it goes on the video archive and a YouTube and basically goes out to the world. Uh, for some of you who were here last week, when Tom Kramikas talked about planetary robotic exploration and biomedical science, uh, there were almost 500 people watching at NIH, and the number outside is about 1,000. So many people are watching with all different kinds of backgrounds and interests. Uh, so this is the 12th year we've been doing this. So we must be doing something right. And so the feedback that we get is encouraging. And we welcome all your suggestions and uh, comments and criticisms. That's the most valuable part. Now, I would ask if you would be kind enough to sign. You'll see the, the last page, not of the book, but where the pen is. Because we keep a record, more or less, to get an idea of the ebb and flow of people and institutes who attend. Uh, those who are taking the course for a uh, certificate, uh, the final exam has been posted electronically on our website. And I encourage you to take it. You could have attended 50% of the sessions. And if you pass the exam, you'll get a certificate from the NIH to that effect. You can take it as many times as you want. It's a multiple choice exam. And I don't think anybody should lose any sleep uh, grinding out, studying for it. It's not that kind of, uh, of an experience. So today, uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have two uh, exemplary leaders in the field of, of aging. And as a liver doctor, sort of contemplating it, and having been around for a few years, I, I kind of get the feeling that thoughts of aging, going back to medieval, well, way back, much earlier times, were all linked up to this notion that youth was something that could be transferred by either the waters in Florida or somebody else's snake oil. And to some extent, I think that influenced thinking about the way people thought about aging. Uh, then there was a period where it seemed to me that aging was something that happened. It was inevitable. Uh, you could accelerate it. I mean, everything ages from molecules to cells, organelles, <coughs> tissues, and people. So maybe it was all part of the same thing. Uh, and then the tremendously uh, powerful increase uh, in biology as related to aging, uh, overlapping with the genomic era and other uh, technical types, imaging and so forth, and disease recognition, have created the situation where we are now. Uh, that it still is an extremely complicated process, but there are some amazing things that have been observed, which lead one to believe, not, not that it is inexorable, <laughs> but that to some extent, uh, life can be made better, uh, not necessarily inevitably prolonged. And more importantly, that mechanistically, we begin to understand. So today's speakers are going to dwell upon different parameters of this. So the, the first speaker is uh, Luigi 
Perucci, uh, who received his MD and PhD degree at the University of Firenze in, in Italy, and then took various training in biology, human physiology, statistics. Uh, he was the head of the Italian National Institute of Aging, collaborated with people in the National Institute of Aging here at NIH, and was back and forth through several years. And in May of 2011, was appointed scientific director. Uh, you will hear of Luigi's work, which is very exciting, provocative, and for some of us with more than a little gray hair, uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, I don't know, predictive may be the proper word. And then our second speaker is uh, near Barzilai, uh, who is, was originally from Israel. Uh, and he received his MD degree in Israel at the uh, Ramban, right? No, Technion, at the Technion. And then trained at the Ramban Hospital. And then in various other places in the United States, in England, uh, and uh, he joined the faculty of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 1993 uh, in the Division of Endocrinology. Uh, he is a bona fide card carrying endocrinologist who has done very exciting work on regulation of metabolism and so forth. And he now is uh, a, prof a professor of genetics and medicine at Einstein, and he's the director of the Institute for Aging Research. Uh, I came upon Neer's work uh, in reading of his extraordinary studies of uh, centenarians. Uh, centenarians, in case you've wondered, are people who live to be 100 or older. And some extraordinary things have emerged from this. Uh, who are these people? How do they do it? Is it predetermined? Is it lifestyle? All of the factors that impact on our current thinking about aging are somehow, to my view, uh, focused upon this relatively small but increasing population group uh, of people who reach the age of 100 or more and they still have extraordinarily uh, successful and fulfilling lives. Is there a fountain of youth in that concept, not to turn the clock back, but to in some way sustain and prevent the degenerative diseases and so forth? So we will begin with Dr. Ferrucci. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I hope that the third time that we will be invited, uh, uh, the weather is going to be better. Otherwise, uh, I think I should forget uh, speaking here, you know, one more time. Uh, I, I, I wanted to tell you today something about uh, um, what we can do now to age better, you know. When I go to a party, when I am at the dinner, I usually have a number of people that come. I think that's here. Well, I, I, I can talk anyway. Um, the, the, you know, there are a lot of people that come to me and say, you know, what can I do? What should I do? What should I eat? How much should I exercise? What, what is that that I need to do? And, and I start saying, well, I really need to go to the bathroom. I have to make a phone call. My wife is calling me from Italy. And I start, I really don't work, uh, you know, in, in this uh, more practical field. And, and um, I think that you don't want to know about uh, the National Institute of Health. Just click on <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and so I, I try to avoid the direct questions because there's so much uncertainty about uh, what we know and what we don't know. And, and uh, for this reason, uh, 
tonight, I decided that I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say I have to go to the bathroom, I have to escape, or my wife is calling me. I went through the literature, and instead of giving the usual lecture, lecture where I only speak about what I do, which is very specific and narrow, I want to give you a glimpse of what can be done and what the literature suggests in terms of what can we do now to really foster our ability to enjoy a very long and healthy life. And I wish I could do that, but I can't. And so that shows that there is incredible heterogeneity in the population. And that's really what we are targeting. We are targeting heterogeneity. Some people age so that in old age, they're still able to um, run a marathon and uh, you know sometimes I'm a runner I'll show you some data about running but, but uh, there are these uh, you know young uh, very teeny tiny women that are just in their 75 or 80 then you you know but, but, but much much faster than me and, and so that show you that there is potential in the human body that is not completely exploited and what we really want to do is to use uh, all the potential that is intrinsic to our genomic uh, uh, material. And that, that's what really is all about uh, what we study about uh, aging. And I wanted to make only one other point, uh, which is uh, extremely important. We always concentrate on a person, and most of the work on aging has been done in that context, but in fact, uh, we're trying to connect the different parts. You know, we are trying to connect the biology of aging of the aging individual, the person with age at the level of a cell of the organ, but also understanding how aging is not an isolation occur in a very large environment that is strongly influenced by that environment. We are also trying to understand that uh, on top of that, uh, there are also temporal scales that are important. You know, there are things happening in a fraction of a second. The variability of heart rate that's so important for our health. And also, when we look at an individual, what's happening in that individual in that time is really has a root that much, much earlier in life. And we are starting to learn how life course epidemiology start from, you know, uh, the time of gestation and many, many of the things that occur on gestation and later on affect the trajectory of aging. In fact, uh, uh, some uh, studies in England have shown that one of the most powerful predictors of disability in middle and old age is the level of education of the mother, suggesting that uh, what you do uh, during the first year of life is really, really important and affect what happens later on. Okay, how can we age gracefully? I really, really like this word, gracefully, because uh, it doesn't imply that you need to be strong. It doesn't imply to me that you need to run faster. It means that uh, you need to enjoy all the part of your life and age gracefully. And I think that there is evidence for all the different line and item that I showed you. And uh, because of limit of time, because I don't want to steal too much time to my, from my friend, Nir, I'm going to concentrate on those that are there. I just want to say that uh, don't, not smoking, stay connected with other people, get busy, have fun, and see regularly your doctor and check with your hearing and vision. There's strong evidence that that can really improve your quality of aging. And so I'm not talking about them, but those are really important. So I'm gonna start about something that to me, it's very, very important and incredible potential, but we still don't understand at all. Uh, I used to have a slide that I searched, but I can't find anymore where I had one little person and then on the side, the amount of young food that this person had been eating for 50 years. I tell you, it's absolutely an enormous mountain. And I used to tell to my student, how comes that this little person is not affected in health for this enormous amount of food they're eating? But in fact, the evidence about changing your eating behavior and uh, pro, you know, in 
proving your chance of a healthy trajectory with aging is still teeny tiny in humans. It's very strong in animal study, but in humans, it's not very, very good. Uh, well, well, I'm, I'm going to start with, with some very quick animal model. We know that uh, uh, there is an increase in longevity uh, in calorie restriction in mice. Uh, there is a lot more evidence in yeast, uh, in worm, and in flies, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. I, I want to concentrate on human. I want to say that, uh, you know, really calorie restriction remain the strongest intervention to prolong longevity in animal models. And in human primate, uh, there's some evidence that this may actually occur. These are data from the Wisconsin court. Uh, they show that uh, the age-related mortality was reduced by calorie restriction. And lately, there are more data showing that even the whole cause mortality may be reduced. But uh, uh, the an analogous and parallel study done in Baltimore really is conflicting with this evidence and show really no a strong effect on mortality. And we can discuss why and you know the quality of the diet, uh, but that's not what I want to say here. What I want to say is that then when you translate uh, this paradigm that you see is so incredibly powerful in animal, the effects uh, are really, really strong if you have uh, an overweight or an obese individual. And so if you lose weight, uh, um, the meta-analysis show that you can improve health uh, and improve longevity, reduce mortality, and reduce the incidence of cardiovascular disease. But even when they do a meta-analysis that is as big as this, uh, from Phil Krzyzewski about the dietary intervention, you yeah, just see an overall effect, but there is incredible variability. And the study, even in overweight uh, uh, individual, and much less in obese individual, show some variability of effect. And then when you translate this to normal individual, when you do one calorie restriction in the people that do not need to lose weight because they're normal weight, things become even more complicated. And the, 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 the reason, uh, it, it's unclear, but, but I, I thought that this article that appeared in the New York Times very recently was really interesting and illuminating. And you know, it's one of the few times that I didn't watch television, but I regretted not doing this because when I was reading that article, I didn't really know what they were talking about. But then reading the article was really interesting. So those people lost enormous amounts of weight by doing very, very severe diet and exercising eight and nine hours per day. And, uh, and when they did that, uh, they lost an incredible amount of weight. One of them, uh, the biggest loser, I think that lost something like 240 pounds, something short of 240 pounds. And so he, he was the winner. But all of them have regained in uh, a year or two most of the weight that they have lost. And some of them have regained even more than they have lost. They have no data on body composition, but I suspect that uh, they lost much more lean body mass and they gained a lot more fat mass. And the reason why, at least in this uh, very rapid intervention, is that uh, the estimated amount of calorie uh, resting metabolic rate and that they consumed by this uh, individual were reducing. And so they were becoming uh, calorically efficient. So they were using less calories than expected. Like, such as uh, there is a, an evolutionary mechanism that uh, allow this individual to uh, slow down, <laughs> to, be, to put the SAM on a lower gear and so work. And so if we have this uh, mechanism that pitch in when we reduce our calories, uh, it's unlikely that we will see a strong effect on calorie restriction in humans, especially if it's done too quickly. And uh, in fact, uh, the, you, the, probably the only uh, large study that was done on calorie restriction in none of these individuals, which is the calorie study, failed to reach what were the primary outcome, which was uh, reduction in resting metabolic rate uh, and reduction in, uh, in, in, in uh, bloody temperature. But uh, they were able to show some collateral uh, effect uh, that were the data on uh, cholesterol and, and blood pressure. But, but on top of that, not only 
the study was not as effective as we hoped for, but uh, uh, the scientists were unable to reduce uh, uh, calorie intake by the 25% that the protocol required, despite of following people weekly and having an incredible support. Uh, and, uh, you know, by um, 24 months, uh, the reduction in calorie compared to the calorie calculated much as low, was much lower than expected. I think I'm going to take question at the end because otherwise we, I will not have enough time for me. Um, okay, I'm going to stop this and say uh, the, 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 the best study probably that showed that there is some effect on nutrition on cardiovascular mortality was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine on uh, the Mediterranean diet, and, and this makes me so happy because I am a representative of somebody who follows a strong uh, diet. However, when you look at the classification and the way the diet, Mediterranean diet was coded, it's quite difficult to follow the criteria that were reported in that paper. You know, I probably use uh, four tablespoons of olive oil every day because my family produced olive oil, but I doubt that many of the people in this room are using four tablespoons of olive oil. Three nuts or peanuts per week, three fresh fruits per day, vegetable, two servings per day, fish, three servings per week, legume, three servings per week, sofrito, which uh, only the Spanish people know what it is, which is uh, some sort of uh, vegetable that is stewed, white meat instead of red meat. Red meat will take you immediately out of the pure Mediterranean diet, and seven glasses of wine, of wine that could be pleasant in a nice uh, uh, party in the evening, but you know, I'm not sure I can drink seven glasses of wine regularly you know, every week. Probably when I was in Italy, I did. I think that I've been contaminated by being so long in the United States. And, uh, you know, the effect were very good. I have to say that the effect were good. The both the Mediterranean diet with nuts and without nuts um, was affecting uh, uh, cardiovascular morbidity. And so I think that uh, uh, as far as we know, this remain uh, you know, the best uh, intervention that we know about, about the positive effect of diet. Um, however, uh, the Women's Health Initiative uh, that tried an approach that was similar to include uh, five serving of uh, uh, fruit or vegetable every day and a supplementation of calcium was completely unable to demonstrate uh, uh, any effect on cardiovascular disease. And uh, so there is some work of discovery, there is some trick and secret in the Mediterranean diet uh, that is just not in fruit and vegetable. And I am sure this is in the wine, but I cannot tell you for sure. Uh, I am so happy that Chris Ramsen is here because I'm gonna cite one of his paper that has been incredibly controversial and uh, recently published in the uh, British Medical Journal. And I, I can make a very long story because this is just a, one of those story where, you know, an investigator becomes a detective and look for, you know, old boxes. Uh, and I did that with the BLSA, so it's very passionate about it. But the bottom line is that uh, he took a very old study where there was an intervention with substitution of saturated fat, with polyunsaturated fat in a large population, the study was lost and then he reconstructed the mortality and found that although the people that had the polyunsaturated fat had seen a very sharp decline in cholesterol, 14% versus 1% in the control, there was no difference in mortality and in fact, the decline, those who experience the sharpest decline in cholesterol experience the highest mortality. We can discuss forever about the interpretation of this, but I will leave you with uh, this idea. I will, this is the only piece of evidence that I show from my work. Uh, I work a lot of inflammation, and I did a study where I fed people with uh, a thousand calorie in the morning in the fasting state. I gave them a meal that was mostly saturated fat and mostly polyunsaturated fat. 
And we saw that uh, the saturated fat increased tremendously with the IL-6. And when we look at uh, the lipoprotein fraction, you know, this is, uh, you need to read that uh, the y-axis is time and the x-axis are the 38 fraction that we look in lipoprotein. And you can see that the, the early LDL that uh, increased at two hour represents uh, the lipoprotein that get oxidated. So there is an hypothesis in the field now that uh, two hours after a meal, you have oxidated lipoprotein in the circulation, the Q could stop by administering selectively in that moment an antioxidant. And there is a study that is looking at that. And so it is possible that it's not what you eat, but when you eat, how you time it. And you know, it could be a lot more complex than just saying how many protein, how many carbohydrates, how many lipids. It's probably, we don't get that. Let me go to exercise. And somebody need to tell me when I'm close to have to finish. Um, the exercise story is so interesting. This is, I took in the internet, uh, I reconstructed the record for the five Ks and uh, by age. And you see that, uh, you know, children of course are fast, but uh, the top uh, performance is around 20, 18 to 20, and then the performance remains stable up to 25 and then tends to go up. And this line that you see here, it's me. So this is my performance, uh, 27 minutes at, uh, for the 5K. It's uh, based on this graph, uh, I'm very close to 80. And I am 90, so I do this really, really well. <laughs> okay, so the effect of physical activity on health, uh, it was established many, many years ago. There are papers as long as uh, 19, 53, but 1938, those who wrote in Oxford and Cambridge, and so demonstrating that those that were sedentary had a much higher rate of heart attack. However, in, 19, in 2015, there was a paper that was published showing that um, maybe doing moderate physical activity was good for you, but doing intense physical activity was associated with very large mortality. And this was a, a very well done study, at least on paper on the Copenhagen City Heart Study. I can tell you that uh, when this paper was published, my email was filled in a day. I got so many emails of my friends that are runners, they were worried that, that they were really shortening their life. And I had a conversation even with my boss, Dr. Hodes, about this uh, on the next day. And we started to say, well, it's really physical activity not so good for you. Fortunately, NCI decided to publish uh, a very, very large study that uh, included more than 600,000 people. I think that with more than 100,000 deaths uh, and a meta-analysis of six very large studies showing that uh, uh, exercise is very good for you. In the client, you are more tired. Even when you exercise, you see that uh, that last point, when you see a very small increase with a large confidence interval, because uh, the number is small, is uh, exercise 10 times the minimum recommended, which is 15 minutes of intense physical activity five times a week, which means that these people are exercising 150 minutes per day five days a week. I don't think anybody of us is doing that. You really need to be somebody very, very competitive to do that. And also, one of the effects of exercise that should really be relevant today is that exercise affect active life expectancy. Not only you have increased survival, but the percentage of life, which is the red part there in those columns where you have uh, improved uh, and increase length uh, is the percentage of life uh, that is characterized by the absence uh, of disease and disability. Why, you know, the part of life uh, that is characterized by disease and disability remain almost stable. So you are really delaying uh, the in initiation of disease and of the, uh, let's say, less pleasant part of life, if we can say that. I'm gonna skip this. Um, what about the aptitude about aging? I wanna finish with something that is really weird and I don't understand. 
In the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, uh, 40 years ago, somebody much, much smarter than me decided to study in people in their 30 and 40 what they thought about aging. And somebody thought that aging was great because uh, you are retiring, you can do whatever you want, you don't longer have to be linked with your job. But somebody else thought that really aging sucks because uh, you know, you get disease, all your friends die, you know, you, 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 you're shrinking and you're losing your air and you have all those uh, effects of the aging phenotypes. And, and so they were pretty healthy at that time, 30 to 40, and then we followed them up. Well, those who had the positive stereotype experience half of the incidence rate of cardiovascular disease. Not only that, but uh, those of the positive stereotype over 30 years of, of time had much less cortisol produced. Cortisol is the hormones that, that express your response to stress. And in the small group that went to autopsy, <coughs> we were able to see that uh, the pathology for Alzheimer, you know, the plaque and the um, deposition of tau were much reduced compared to those who had a positive stereotype. And those with the positive stereotype experience a much less decline in the hippocampal volume in our study on, uh, on, 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 on neuroimaging. And you know that there is something really weird about Alzheimer where there are few people that uh, in spite of the fact that at autopsy you find incredibly severe pathology for Alzheimer, you find that uh, when they die, they're perfectly integral. They are perfectly cognitive intact. And those people had characteristic with uh, very low neuroticism uh, and very high conscientiousness measured at 30 years in advance uh, that somewhat protected them, although the mechanism is very, very unclear. Uh, I will finish with two things quickly. One is sleep, and sleeping is really, really important. You know, with, uh, oh, this slide is all twisted. I'm sorry, but uh, um, it, it, to make a very long story short, uh, our neuroimaging study had demonstrated that those who sleep seven hours have uh, much less accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain than those that sleep less for more than seven hours. Seven hours appear to be really magic. And I'm gonna skip everything else, so I have time to show you this. This is a, a very happy group of people. Um, and, and you know, many, many years ago, I think this is uh, 1948, uh, and the guy that you see on the left is Nathan Schock, the person who created the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, uh, and that also really was uh, the person who was the first NIA director. And uh, I want to tell you what he was writing in the newspaper in 1950. So far, they can give you only very few points about aging. A few of the dons Dr. Schock said are these. Don't overexert. Exercise after the age of 40 won't keep you young and may, if overdone, hasten old age. If you're already middle aged, don't play your work to the point of being short of breath. Don't indulge in diet fat in the hope of staying young. If you want to give up eating eggs or drinking milk, it's probably all right, provided that you substitute other items which are equally nutrition. The pearl is at the end. There is no indication that alcoholic beverage or smoking in moderation have any effect on longevity. And I think we can do much better than that nowadays. Thank you for your attention. Perhaps you want a question at the end? Well, I suppose so. Oh, yeah. Please. Just a little bit on uh, attitude towards aging. Was that specifically the attitude about aging, or was it a general ask possibly attitude about life? No, no. They were asked, what do you think about aging? But did they ask them about, about yeah, yeah. questions? Or they... Well, they asked about the number of other. Well, this was a questionnaire. 
that was called attitude toward aging. And this is a score that was created by a number of questions about what you think about aging. And this is a work by Becca Levy, I forgot to tell you, that is at uh, Yale University. Weight reduction following elongated diet restriction. But I would actually argue that that is a mechanism for um, helping aging. Basically, you're not losing weight because your metabolism is slowing down, and the metabolism is slowing down is causing less, you know, ROS and whatever side effects of metabolism are happening so that you're maintaining yourself equally at a lower functioning speed. Well, basically. if your body composition will remain the same, you will be right. But we know that the body composition, the percentage of uh, body fat, uh, and the low percentage of lean body mass is one of the strongest predictors of mortality we know. So overweight, uh, up to 27 or 30, there's really no difference between uh, being a BMI below 25. I still think that 25 should be used uh, above the age of 60. But when you go over a BMI of 30, clearly the effect of mortality is defined. And you're right, uh, I think that uh, there is a decline in resting metabolic rate that is physiological with aging that is somewhat appear to be protective. And it's protective because uh, the people that have increased in resting metabolic rate with aging use that energy to defend themselves. They are under attack, uh, and that is a compensatory strategy. Hi. Uh, I've been reading and, and uh, listening to a number of talks regarding uh, exercise and longevity, and you touched on this, and a, a question that I um, need clarification for is with regard to intensity versus time. <laughs> so, for example, am I better off exercising at the very top of my target heart rate or above that, assuming I can tolerate it, or am I better off exercising much longer at the lower end of my target heart rate, if my goal is a healthy heart and or longevity. And the part two on the uh, exercise is a lot, of, a lot of lecturers talk about, when they talk about exercise, they're referring to cardio exercise. And I hardly hear anyone talk about other exercise, uh, strength training, strength endurance, uh, flexibility and so forth, and if you have any comments about that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I, I will say that, uh, you know, your question is spot on, and I will tell you that we don't know. I think that... I uh, didn't want to hear well, that. When, when the people have my comparison between aerobic exercise and resistant exercise, the effect on health and parameter of health have been very, very comparable. So I have a rule of thumb that I use for myself. I think you need to do three types of exercise. You need to do aerobic exercise because it's important for your cardiovascular. You need to maintain muscle, so some resistant exercise. And you need to do something that improve your core because these are the muscles that age more than any other during the aging process. Are there other questions you wish to ask uh, at this point? There's a lady behind you. Let's. I apologize, I came in late, maybe you covered it. <laughs> but um, I guess you, you mentioned uh, cortisol levels and you know this attitude about uh, aging and that's gonna be fun. But now, that, that study, it seems, started how many years ago? 40 years ago. 40, and our economy is very different. <laughs> and aging looks different to a lot of us now because one, our diets changed from how we started 40 years ago, the people who have died in that period, and also our concerns about <coughs> enough money to live long enough. So um, is there another study that's gonna go on <laughs> about, well, I mean, about your worry problem. about paying for retirement and that's how that affects your life? That's a longitudinal study. There are longitudinal studies that are starting now, and even longitudinal study in children. The problem is that uh, when, uh, you know, my successor in 50 years will be talking to this audience. Somebody will tell them, yes, but in 2016, uh, you know, the socioeconomic condition and the health condition were different. So 
it, it, it's, we are dealing with this issue all the time. There are secular trends, and we're starting to see secular trends. For example, we have a trend in obesity. There's a recent paper showing that uh, the nadir for mortality, you know, the optimal BMI for mortality has shifted uh, over the secular, the, the secular era, so that uh, it is much higher now, around 27, 28, uh, that was uh, 50 years ago, that was 24 to 25. The reason why shifting are really unclear, but certainly you're right, there are secular trends that we can't really capture in longitudinal study because of the, their nature. And one quick, more optimistic question. I saw you flip through a slide about, uh, a slide about interleukin. Yes. And um, I had seen some studies about how that was beneficial to your health. <laughs> I mean, and, and going walking in nature and, and, and having awe experiences and things like that. So I, I think that, that uh, you know, my, my work is on inflammation, and that's why I didn't touch on inflammation a lot. Uh, but I think that uh, it's very clear that the exercise uh, Reducing body fat at the level of the GERD, you know, in, in, in your middle body, a very, very effective in reducing inflammation. And IL-6 is a strong predictor of multiple chronic disease. Probably is the strongest predictor on developing multimorbidity. So we should try to do something to put it down. Neil. Okay. Well, we'll save questions till the end of Neil's talk. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. You don't know to get on the grid? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, I used to, but <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, in here? So, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Wynn. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you, all uh, the other uh, people that I know here. Um, I was told that the audience is ma mainly postdoc. And my observation is that postdocs at the NIH are quite old. <laughs> I'm assuming it's you guys there. Um, but wh whoever you are, it's, it's nice to be here. I also enjoyed uh, to have this title of demystifying aging. Um, I think I, could have, I couldn't have, but if somebody was here giving you a lecture on immunotherapy in cancer, you would have learned a lot. But it wouldn't have changed much for you if you were in the HNLB wide, the NIDDK, NIA, maybe. Um, but the mystifying aging is something that I claim that by the end of this talk, you might actually think, wherever you are, if you're doing any research that is doing with aging, that you can see that what we're doing is very much related to you. We're encouraging you to take into account the biology of aging, because a lot of those diseases that you are looking at are in aging, and a lot of the mechanisms of aging are important for uh, this disease to appear. At the NIH, demystifying aging is called something else. It's called geroscience. And the guy who invented the geroscience concept is right here, Felipe um, Sierra, who's the director of the Division of uh, Aging Biology. Um, and I hope that through his work and uh, us being his disciple, you'll uh, get and understand it better uh, and better. So demystifying, I'll start with the biology of aging by making just few statements based on data that is not uh, mine. And the first thing is to see this relationship that was there when I came to the field and many of my colleagues. This is the relationship between age-related disease, uh, death from age-related disease and aging. And please note that the y-x is a log scale. So take out, take uh, each one of those diseases. Oh, I can do it here. Um, take a heart disease or cancer or uh, diabetes or Alzheimer's. And you see that the risk of death of any one of those diseases goes from 1 to 1,000 when you go from young age to old age. And, the, and by the way, the lines are, uh, are kind of parallel. You kind of get the impression that it's a common risk, and therefore it might have a common mechanism. And for us, when we looked at that, we said, that's 
kind of terrible because let's say we make a major advance in one disease, okay? What's going to happen? We're going to exchange it with another disease. It's only if we target aging that we can, uh, we can move it on. Think about it. If you go to the emergency room with a, a, a chest, chest pain, now, now I'm glad there are people with some white hair. If you go with chest pa pain and you get a stent, it's fine. But you know what happened to the people who got stent within two years? They get diabetes or cancer or Alzheimer or, or, or they have another heart attack because we never did the aging part. We only did the technical heart part. So this is one thing uh, to remember. In a defensive mood, I always say, of course, what you get first, okay, depends on your interaction with the genetic environment. I'm, I'm not saying that the NIH needs to stop being silos and be only aging. I'm not saying that. I'm wishing it, but I'm not really saying it. But, but, uh, but, but of, course, uh, of, of course, there's a, a lot of things here. What is the evidence that we succeeded in delaying aging? Um, so, yeah, we are, and, and by the way, a lot, Luigi, a lot of what you said is really good for me to repeat in other words, because I think we're making a statement here. Yeah, you can look at, at the cellular aging, and you, you can look at the genome aging, and you can look at the metabolic of aging. And we've done something really clever in the field we started looking at animals that live longer. And through that, we learned a lot about aging, but more important, we got clues of how to actually target aging. And I will make those two statements. Healthy lifespan, not, not only lifespan, has been extended in numerous models. It has been extended from yeast to nematodes to flies to mice to uh, rats, to primates, by interventions such as genetic intervention, by environment like the caloric restriction, or by drugs, okay? We've done all those studies. Um, and second is some of those drugs are actually in human use, not, not anything that has to do with aging, but in human use. I would say the following. If those preclinical studies that we have done can be translated to humans, we're talking about you spending 80 years in the next deck, starting with the next decade, 80 years to become biologically 60. Okay, that is the extent of, of what we have done in variety of animals. And we're a little frustrated that this is not moving on. And I'll tell you uh, in a few minutes how we deal with this frustration. I think, um, Luigi made very nice the, the, the point, much nicer than the question, do we human age at different rates? Here should be your slides with all the people who are either in the hospital or jogging the marathon, right? We, everybody knows intuitively that we age at different rates, and yet we haven't re been really good at understanding why some people are aging fast and some people are aging slow. And that was behind uh, my thought uh, almost a couple of decades ago that we should start looking at uh, 100 years old that are so rare, only one out of 10,000. Uh, by the way, now it's like one of 5,000, but they're more bionic. But one of 10,000 when I started, uh, we're 100 years old. And I have two studies that I'm not going to uh, describe it because it's not so important. But we have over 600 um, uh, families of centenarians, and we have um, about 1,200 of their offspring, and I'll tell you how we use those populations. When you do genetic study, it's always important. Uh, you know, the best, the best population are the Icelandic. The Icelandic are children of five Vikings and four Irish women, okay? They're kind of <laughs> brothers, cousins. And so if some of them get diabetes, you can find genes for diabetes much, much nicer. And this is kind of behind of why we're sticking to the population of uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, oops, oops, this is not, okay. And uh, as we and other started looking at centenarians, again, with the idea that their aging has been slow, um, we discovered that there are many, uh, that, that there's a strong family history of being 100 years old. 
so having a rare occurrence with a combination of being in the family was very encouraging for us. And so we started making two hypotheses. One hypothesis is, you know, those centenarians just don't have all this other garbage that we hear about, you know, SNPs and mutations for uh, cardiovascular disease, for Alzheimer's, for, um, for other things. Or uh, another hypothesis is maybe they have mutations or SNPs or something that makes them makes their aging slow. Of course, what's important, first of all, to convince you is that those 100 years old, it's not that they got sick when everybody got sick, and then they lived sick for the last 40 years of their life. And what this graph shows you is not the mortality of those people, but it's when they became sick. And the two groups on the right in the blue and red are one is my study and one is the New England Centenarian study. And the green and the, the red on the, on the left lines are the control group. And basically what you see here that lifespan, health span, okay, the time that they had disease was extended by 20, 30 years. Okay, so it's not only they lived longer, they lived healthier. But there is something even much more exciting. And that is they were sick much less at the end of their life. There was a compression of their morbidity. And the compression of morbidity was depicted by the CDC, who was looking at medical costs in the last years of life. And you see here that in the last two years of life, medical costs for somebody who died at 100 was third of that, uh, somebody who dies at the age of 70. And it's not the whole story, because those 100 years old, when they were 60, they, they even didn't go to the doctor. So you can actually find what we call a longevity dividend. If we can have people live healthy and die in a shorter period of time, this is $7 trillion right there until the, the year 2050. So Wynn asked me to introduce um, one of our patients, so I'm going to do it right now. It's a three-minute clip. And the reason uh, I'd like you to see this clip is it's a, it's a guy that's almost 105 years old. He died when he was under 108. But the point here is to see that if you're healthy at 105 years old, life is good, okay? That's, that's what I'd like you uh, to take from it. So let's watch it for a few minutes. In this office building on Madison Avenue, New York City, 104-year-old investment advisor Irving Kahn is working hard, as he has since his career on Wall Street began in 1928. He shares his secret to a long and healthy life. To wake up in the morning and have something to look forward to. Irving's curiosity and keen business sense have led him to become a widely respected value investor, a member of the New York Stock Exchange, and chairman of Kahn Brothers, the company he founded more than 30 years ago with two of his sons, including Thomas, who is the president. Irving works five days a week with his 67-year-old son and 29-year-old grandson, Andrew. And how are you going to link the underwriting projects? Playing an integral part in managing over $700 million in assets. This is the Aztec website. And Irving says not working is unthinkable. Well, I would pay you if you took it away from me. I, I try to buy it back. He believes mental challenge is key. The important thing is to keep that brain going, you see. 50.2%. To stay sharp, Irving reads materials online, two financial newspapers daily, and a wide range of nonfiction. I read a lot of science. I read no fiction, no mystery stories, and no sex novels. So that leaves a lot of time for science. And it was Irving's interest in science that led him to participate in the Longevity Genes Project at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, led by researcher Nir Barzilai. Nir and his team have recruited more than 500 healthy elderly, ages 95 to 112, and their children. Irving and Thomas are part of the study, as is Irving's big sister, 108-year-old Helen Reichert, a former television host and fashion historian. 
So far, Mir and his team have found several gene variants that are more common in this group and protect against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Erwin uh, has the CTP genotype that seems to be protective against several age-related diseases, including uh, cognitive decline. Mir's team has also found... I'll, I'll, I think you got the gist. Um, um, so, yes, um, you see here in the picture, there are four, four siblings that were born to two parents between 1910 and 1920, uh, and all of them achieved the age of 102. They're, they're absolutely shocked when the little sister died at 102. And uh, Helen got to be 110, uh, 106, and 108. Um, uh, so it, it just did demonstrate you uh, this special uh, po population and gives you this clue of uh, exceptional uh, genetics here. So as, as Luigi said, you know, maybe what happened is those guys did what the doctors tell us to do now, you know? Maybe that's their secret. Maybe it's all about the environment. So let me show you that. Overweight and obesity over almost 50% of the people. Uh, smoking, 60% of the men and 30% of the women. Helen, which you saw, the sister, she celebrated 95 years of cigarette smoking. <laughs> so if you, if you smoke for 95 years, you're going to live long, long life. But I, I think it really, uh, really tells you about the protection that those guys have. Alcohol daily, as Luigi said, not enough. Um, uh, physical, um, physical activity, less than 50% of the people. We're talking about moderate. In our, in our paper, we had all kinds of. And I know there's a vegan here in the crowd. Uh, we don't have any vegans. And the number of vegetarians is really very low in this population. So I think it's not uh, the environment. Or the paper was compared to enhance, which is their cohort, pretty much. And there are other the same or, or worse than their, their cohort. But as a group, it's not that they are interacting with the environment. OK, now let's go to the demystifying from the genetic um, a point of view. And I, I will tell you that until we came with the idea of centenarians, a lot of what we try to learn in, in aging was the progeria. It's taking the people actually who are aging very rapidly, uh, having severe disease, lots of aging phenotype, and trying to understand them and see if we can learn from aging from them, which we learned uh, to a great uh, extent. And when we went to exceptional longevity, this was the state of genetics. I mean, thanks God, the human genome was a uh, clone. And people have started creating this idea that with GWAS or with genotyping million SNPs around the, the genome, we'll just have a great handle of, the, of diseases. And it really didn't happen that way. There's lots of common variants and, and common phenotypes. 90% um, of the variants uh, are in non-coding regions, so we don't know exactly what to do with them. Some of them, we don't know if you were the gene before or the gene after. And they all had relatively small effects. I mean, all the knowledge that we have from GWAS accounts for maybe 4% of the phenotype of any, any disease. We, uh, and we did GWAS, and we got nowhere <laughs> with the GWAS uh, all over the world. And we changed, or in, it's, it's really in parallel, we changed and we said we should uh, go to candidates and find real mutations. You know, the mutations are not going to be in everyone, but if we find cluster of mutations, this will be really good. First of all, we're going to look only or, or mainly at the coding variants, so it's going to have a, a, a strong effect. And if we have really several people with those mutations, we can start more of drug development. Okay, so this is kind of the introduction to genetics. And the first thing I want to show you is what happened to our theory, our first hypothesis, that maybe all it is is those guys have the perfect genome, okay? Nothing special, then just not, nothing killed them. So in our first 44 centenarians that underwent a whole genome sequencing, okay, huge 
project. The first thing that we went is went to this website that's called CleanVar. And CleanVar had the 15,000 uh, mutations that are most probably going to cause a disease. Okay? So the idea was centenarians shouldn't be, sh shouldn't have one of those, right? Because one mutation with 100 years of life, they should be sick. Okay, you have no idea what you're going to see here. In 44 centenarians, we have more than 230 mutations that should have made them sick. And, and if you're asking what are they? Yeah, two Parkinson mutations, Alzheimer mutation, degenerative disease, neoplastic disease, cardiac, other dominant, okay? It's a mess, but, and, and by the way, there are some SNPs that are less presented in centenarians, you know, SNPs that are associated with disease. So it's a mixed picture. But you understand, well, you understand, first of all, that, uh, you know, you wonder if the clean VAR has really the right mutation. A lot of them are people who have a disease and nobody know what it is, and they do a whole genome sequencing, and they find some mutation and say, oh, that's the disease. And it's probably not the disease. But, but it does give you, because some of those mutations are very well characterized, and they seem to have a mutation and not get sick in 100 years of life. So uh, the other thing is to find a, a variants or mutations, and basically the idea is, is to show something that is rare when they are young and that is overrepresented when they are old. And I'm going to show you a picture, and I'm not going to go into any one of those, just make general comment because I want to show you a pathway that I think is really very important to humans. But what you see here is those mutations, they're all functional, that are in kind of, uh, you know, between 8 and 12 percent, basically when you're 60, and they're overrepresented when, when you're old. Two of them, the lower two, the blue and the, and the red, are both lipoproteins. One is it really has to do with HDL cholesterol and the other also with HDL cholesterol and triglycerides. It's interesting that the pharmaceuticals looked at our data and they developed two drugs, not for aging, but for cardiovascular disease, because they felt that if centenarians carry those mutations, it means that the safety of, of this drug should be great, because you have a naturally occurring people like that. So Merck is in phase three trial of a CTP inhibitor, and the unfortunate uh, uh, pharmaceutical by the name of ISIS is developing an APO C3 uh, inhibitor. But it, it also to show you the, the genetic can be immediately translated to drugs, right? People are saying, oh, you're doing genetic study, do we have to have gene transplant? No. But I think the most, the most I'm excited with is the growth hormone IGF pathway, and I think it's also important clinically because there are lots of anti-aging people out there that are administering growth hormone to elderly. There is a billion dollar industry in administering growth hormone to the elderly. How much of that would you have liked to the, your division uh, to search for real things uh, rather than... so? Um, now, in nature, it's a really different story. The small live longer, the little dogs live longer, the ponies live longer than the thoroughbreds. When you mutate the growth hormone IGF signaling pathway in many animals, they live longer. The mice that are born dwarf or made dwarf are living longer than the transgenic that have growth hormone, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to tell you, I was very skeptical about the role of this pathway in aging because being an endocrinologist, I looked at the data and said, yeah, when you have high IGF, then you have increased risk for many of the cancers, okay? But when you have high IGF, you also have decrease in several other things like osteoporosis, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, cognitive uh, function. So I thought, you know, it's just, you know, it's just going to balance itself out. Until we found Yuxing Su, who's a great human geneticist, uh, 
basically sequence the whole IGF re, IGF-1 receptor. So that's one of the growth hormones, right? Growth hormone, liver, here there's liver, IGF-1, and so growth hormone has its own actions beside growth, but a lot of the growth are, are through IGF-1. So we were looking at the IGF receptor because mutation of the IGF receptor is associated with longevity. And Yushin found two new mutations in our centenarians. So it's a cluster. We had nine centenarians with those mutations. It was, um, it was functional mutations. I'm not going to show you the data. There's the reference there. And the women who had these mutations had, um, were shorter and had higher IGF one level. In other words, it's cluster of women that this system must have protected them against something. Now, this wasn't the only thing. We, we, we were working on this paper for three years, and the reason is we had to validate it. But we found that our centenarians, you see that the, the line here goes from 4% to 12%, they have deletion of exon 3 in growth hormone. Okay, deletion in exon 3 in growth hormone. And we found three other populations, the Amish, the French Caucasian, and the, and the white from the CHS study, all of them exhibiting increase of this mutation with uh, exceptional aging, suggesting that it really plays a role. Um, so so this, is under, uh, th this is going to be submitted soon. But that's not the only thing. And, and you see, the, the way I'm starting to be convinced is, OK, the IGF receptor is 2%. You can still say, OK, 2% have this mutation, but that doesn't mean that certainly that all centenarians need to have growth hormone deficiency. But now we have 12% with the, with the deletion of growth hormone receptor. And then we found, we, uh, Yushin Su, found microRNA, clusters of microRNA, that accounts for more than 30% of our centenarians that are uh, actually inhibiting the IGF receptor. So 2 and 12 and 30, all of a sudden, we're talking about half of the centenarians we find something inhibiting their growth hormone IGF axis. On top of that, we looked whether, um, whether so we have the centenarians that, are, that got to us kind of healthy. And we ask, what is the phenotype that's going to predict best their mortality? The, their mortality is almost 30% a year. And the answer in female was that those with the lowest IGF-1 levels lived basically twice as long uh, as those with a higher half. Um, again, suggesting that this is really uh, powerful, even in those very old. And as it is in nature, it's gender specific. The growth hormone IGF is very gender specific. Actually, the IGF is really more female, and the growth hormone receptor is more uh, male. So this was just an example, um, or several examples, to show you that this population um, is, is uh, uh, you, you, very unique. I mean, it's it's an extreme population. It's very unique, and there is a lot of findings. Those are not the only one, but uh, clusters of findings or mutation that seems to be associated with delaying their aging. And the question now is, what do we do? What do we do beside the environment? Okay, what do we do? And, and let me again emphasize what I showed in centenarians is not what we recommend, that you smoke and be obese and not exercise, right? <laughs> Luigi <laughs> said it right. Um, so what, you know, are we ready to do something in order to show the public and to convince everyone that aging can be targeted? And what happened again with, a, with a initiative from Felipe's division, we got a grant uh, to get the biology of aging that have find all those great things, and the geriatrician or the intervention geriatrician, getting them together and trying to educate each other. <coughs> By the way, the biologists always think, oh, you want to show a drug, take eight people and treat them, and let's see if it works. And, and, 
and the, the geriatrician looking at the biology of aging and saying that they're crazy for other reasons. So the, this communication was really important. And one of the things that came out of the communication is this idea of using metformin to target aging. And I have to say that we're using metformin as a tool, and I'll explain later. But why metformin? First of all, in the biology of aging, um, in a lot of animal, between um, nematodes and mice, um, metformin extends lifespan, but even more important, it extends healthy uh, lifespan. Um, one thing, okay, so this is the biology of aging. Second, if you take non-diabetics, and in the famous DPP, the diabetes, diabetes prevention trials, you give half of them uh, metformin, it prevents diabetes by about 31%. If you have diabetes, and in a control study you give either metformin or another drug for diabetes, you have 31%, 32% less cardiovascular effects. Throughout the years, it became apparent that people with diabetes who are treated with metformin have much less cancer, also at around 30-something per, per, uh, percent. Almost all cancer except prostate. Also, there's an early support and actually a study from this month on non-diabetic people with MCI that metformin delays cognitive decline as well. But I really uh, want to show you uh, this study. And this study is a phase four study. It's not very popular in, in the United States, but nobody, metformin is generic and cheap. Nobody, nobody studies. But you go in the UK into the uh, pharmacies and you identify people, and in this case, 78,000 people, that's the green line, 78,000 people that were put on metformin. And you just look at mortality. You match them with the black group that are 78,000 people who visit the same doctor but do not have diabetes and therefore they're not on metformin. And you take 12,000 people who are not treated with metformin, but another drug for diabetes, that's the sulfonylurea class, 12,000 people of those, and you match them with 12,000 people in the red that are non-diabetic, not, not uh, on sulfonylurea. And, and you see that uh, sulfonylurea is associated with more mortality, and we knew that diabetes is associated with more mortality. But really the interesting thing is that people on metformin, the green line, that are obese, more obese, diabetic, s begin the metformin when they had more disease that control, actually has less mortality than non-diabetic people. So it shows you that metformin has a strong effect on the biology of aging, it has strong effect on mortality. And all those data together convinced us that we can use metformin as a tool. And why am I saying as a tool? Because I'm personally not so interested to repeat studies that were done for each disease before. Uh, but we want to show that in the elderly, we can delay uh, multiple comorbidities by using this drug for the main reason, and that is for the FDA, we want to get from the FDA an indication that it will be equivalent for aging. And we have talked with the FDA, and clearly the FDA is instructing us, and we're working together to get to it. Okay, We are talking with the FDA. The FDA understands the FDA's interest, and we have a way to target aging without needing to call it aging, but the multimorbidities associated with aging. And this is our main goal. Because you have to understand, if the FDA does not approve a drug that targets aging, the pharmaceuticals are not going in to develop the next generation drugs that we have some of them and we can get better all the time. Because the, phar the uh, uh, pharmaceuticals are not going to develop a drug that the healthcare healthcare system is not going to pay. So we think the breakthrough in our effort to delay aging will come when we break through with the TAME. The TAME 
is a bunch of scientists coming to the FDA without any uh, pharmaceutical backing us saying, you know, we want to do that. We, we were at the FDA and never mentioned metformin because everything you want to know about metformin is at the FDA site. Now, what we are doing also, we are doing a template so that pharmaceuticals that want to develop a drug know what kind of study to do. And the study to do is much less than it takes to develop a drug for diabetes or cardiovascular disease, much, much fewer people. And also, we want to be able to tell those anti-aging charlatans, if, if you really think that you have something against aging, this is the study that you have to do in order to uh, comply with it. In short, what we're doing is we are taking basically everyone, everyone over the age of 65. With disease, without disease, we're taking 3,000 people and we are doing a double-blind placebo-controlled study in about 14 centers. And the primary outcome here is the time until any of those clinical outcomes that are cardiovasculars, cancer, dementia, or death. So there is no statistically significant. So let, let's say you had cancer. We want to see that we prevent cardiovascular disease. Um, if you had cancer, we want to see that you, we prevent dementia or the time. So there's no one disease that we're interested. We're interested time until any of those diseases. And we have, we have the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the development of this uh, thought and what it means from a statistical perspective. But obviously, the more outcomes you have, the less people you need. And when you take people between 65 and 79, in a five-year study, six-year study, you have a lot of outcomes. So, uh, and the secondary outcomes are basically those that are related to phenotype of aging. And again, the, the reason we have power here is that the more, the more phenotype we throw in, the, more, the, the less people we need, uh, pretty much. So that's how it goes. And in a way, what we're trying to do is the following. You know, I showed you the log scale in the beginning of the association of uh, death from diseases and aging. After the age, the age of 60, that's where it becomes logarithmic. The people who have more than three conditions, they just, just skyrocket here, okay? And it's e equal to men and women, and it's equal uh, among uh, races. And what we're trying to do with the TAME is flatten this curve, okay? And this will be... The first tool, uh, we think we can uh, make it. Uh, there are other challenges because we don't have the uh, pharmaceuticals behind us. So there's other uh, challenges, but we, th we think we can make it. And we think that it's going to be a cheap study compared to how we are going to intervene with aging and delay disease as it, it comes uh, on. So I'm going to uh, finish now. I want to emphasize. What, what did I try to, demyst to demystify and why? So I kind of uh, said that what, the way for us to look at aging is to connect it to age-related disease. After all, that's kind of what the FDA will uh, approve for us, right? The important point, and, I, and I'll say it, the important point for those of you who are at the NIDDK, at uh, the NHLB, the NCI, is that there is a biology of aging. And a lot of your studies are done on two months old mice, okay? And I think it's out of the context of disease where the major risk for this disease is aging, okay? Cardiovascular disease and cholesterol. Cholesterol is a threefold risk and aging is a thousandfold risk. So I think this GeroScience initiative applies immediately for some of you of how you would like to do the study. And I would tell you that the NIA is negotiating of how they can allow you to get money to use uh, older rats. Um, also, we want to make, it, make everybody understand that in the silos that we have, aging needs to come across. The NIA with 3% of the budget cannot uh, take care of all this intervention that has benefits to so many uh, institutes. Uh, so there is a biology uh, of aging. I wrote it, the target uh, is well-defined, but 
we still have a lot to learn about aging. We're, we're not done. And, and as I said, I think TAME is a tool, but I think there'll be more mechanism and better drugs and that can happen rapidly. And I showed you that the intervention the delay, uh, uh, that delays aging in many uh, species and, um, and, um, and also that uh, I told you about this targeting uh, in humans. If you can see, um, if you're interested in Ron Howard, the director, did a breakthrough episode about uh, aging. It's called The Age of Aging. This is a great, a great film that takes you through some of the labs and some of the thoughts across, and it'll be nice to see. So um, thank you very much. This is the consortium uh, that is doing the TAME. AFAR is supporting the initial development, and there are lots of other people who are involved in the other study. Thank you for listening. Yeah, you know, I meant to come back to it, and it's not going to be a long answer. Uh, it's going to be published, by the way, in uh, Cell Metabolism, coming up with a with a metformin action soon. But b basically, what what I put the slides is is to show you that there are some things in aging that we kind of agree on. Okay, we. You see there are mTOR and sirtuin and AMP kinase and inflammation. And this is kind of what we know about aging. It happens that metformin, as you see there in orange, affects a lot of those pathways. The, the question for me is, does metformin have my one action that is maybe upstream to everything and then it fixes aging and other things also are getting good? Or is it a super drug? And I'm, I'm kind of debating, maybe it's a little bit of both. Maybe there is a major mechanism of action, but some other things that helps. Um, but, but we know a lot of what metformin is doing in this biology. And is it more than its basicity? It, then? More than its basicity. It's going to be K of 12 or 14. A basicity? Yeah, the very basic compound. Yeah, be, oh, the, the fact that it's a basic compound. Yeah, it's more than that. It's more than that, because there are other basic compounds that do nothing in longevity. No, they drink, uh, our centenarians uh, drink um, uh, one cup of wine a week in 24% of the men and 12% of the women, much less. <laughs> they drink a big cup, you're saying. <laughs> Yes, Felipe, Felipe I, I wish you heard this question because this is what I want to propose tomorrow in our phone call. The, the mechanism of the action of metformin, I think what I believe personally is that it starts on complex one. It inhibits complex one and then it changes ATP AMP ratio, activate AMP kinase and, and does that. And that means that we have not really looked at the relevant biology of aging mechanism of metformin. And I think it should be a study because we have enough knowledge to know that it's important and we're not done. I'm not sure that the glucose lowering effect of metformin are actually the major mechanism. Maybe there are side effects, but not the major mechanism because we can, we can lower glucose in other ways and not get this uh, uh, longevity. The, uh, the other, uh, you, you want to say something about it? <laughs> well, it wasn't more effective in the elderly, but the, the DPP had um, 
in metformin intervention and lifestyle intervention, where they did uh, exercise three times a week with those people. It was just as effective as metformin. Uh, actually, it was more effective in metformin generally, but in the elderly, it was just as effective as, as, as metformin. Um, and sorry? The, the polypill would exercise, you mean? Yeah. Polypill. Right. Does anyone know what happens when you transplant into an elderly animal in the theory of the tissue from a young animal? Yeah, so we have actually, you should, uh, when you should visit us, we have a Nathan Shock Center. Again, Nathan Shock Centers are coming from the Division of Bio of aging biology. Um, and in our Nathan Shock Center, we have a core that does a parabiosis, or in our case, chronobiosis. We take animals that are genetically homogeneous and we connect them like Siamese twins uh, in their abdomen. So they have, uh, they share similar blood circulation. So we're doing young and young and old and old, but also young and old. And what we are uh, finding, we, we, we were not the first. I, I think the first is Tom Rando that shows that when you do that, you can um, improve muscle regeneration after injury by uh, stimulating stem cell. But what, what we show is basically that the old are getting younger and sometimes the young are getting older by sharing their blood uh, circulation. And we have a core. If you think of an experiment like that, we can provide this for $1,000, you can get a trio, young, 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 old. And if you do the experiment three times, uh, you really can uh, find, uh, you can start finding things that are uh, important for the blood. Uh, your question is, is uh, but this is, uh, you're asking me as a doctor, and my, my price for private consultation is $3,500. <laughs> <laughs> and and the metformin dose that we'll have is around fifteen hundred milligrams. Uh, it's on. It's, it should be. It's on. not high. High is uh, you can give metformin up to twenty five fifty, and probably three thousand is not toxic either. Well, I showed, uh, I, I don't know what uh, I said, but what I showed is that there are a cluster, cluster of functional mutations in the IGF-1 receptor in nine of our centenarians, the two percent of our centenarians that have functional mutations. So they're a little bit shorter and they got to 100 and we don't find it in control. I, that's what, Well, I said that one of the problems is that people are using growth hormone, which means also increasing IGF to prevent aging. Growth hormone, the reason it works, growth hormone is lipolytic. So people who take growth hormone, their face become more tight. And so they feel that that's an anti-aging effect. But in <laughs> fact, the growth hormone can promote cancers and do other things. Uh, the safety of that is really terrible. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. The people, li people are listening. No, it's taping. It's it's taping. Ta yeah, but now it's working. So there's a study by Walter Long using uh, people who are mutant on this uh, growth hormone receptor. Uh, it's a group in uh, Colombia, no, in Ecuador. Ecuador. In Ecuador. And actually those people, they never develop either diabetes or uh, cancer in all the people and they have history for, for it's, it's a whole village actually. They have long history and they never seen, I think they've seen one case of cancer. So, so the role of low growth hormone seems to be true in humans as well, not just in C. elegans. Uh, th those, are, those are the people, by the way. I, I had a chance, <laughs> you know, that's one of the, of the uh, Laurent dwarf. And they have low IGF. I took it out of the lecture. 
And here is the relatives without the mutation, and here are the one with the mutation. And you see that they had um, the diabetes. Those guys have 5% diabetes. Those don't have diabetes. And those guys have, uh, where's the uh, cancer? Here, cancer. And those guys don't have cancer. Um, so, uh, so beside our centenarians, those guys, and some of the other discoveries suggest that in humans, it's a very relevant, uh, a, a very relevant uh, study. So let me ask you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have another. Oh, yes. So are you taking the metformin yourself? Sorry. Are you taking the metformin yourself? Well. <laughs> uh, I, I, unfortunately, I do, but let me explain to you. I'm, um, I, have a, I, I had a diabetic mother, and I was pre-diabetic. And when I was pre-diabetic, which was three years ago, before we conceived the TAME trial, my physician put me on metformin. I don't mind that, but I wish I could say, because I wish I, could, I didn't take it, and I wish I could say that until the study is done, I'm not recommending it to each one. We're, we're sorry. <laughs> well, it, it'll be five, six years when it starts being funded. <laughs> but why are you, of all people, are you asking? Are you, are you older than you look? <laughs> so, if I remember, there was a uh, famous Swedish endocrinologist, Jan Aki Gustafsson, who studied growth hormone in relationship to the hypothalamus and how, in turn, that regulates a lot of the physical functions of growth hormone that were quite independent of the hormone itself. And I, I'm sort of curious in uh, whether the mutations that you're talking about <coughs> could be affecting, essentially, the central nervous system responses and signaling, rather than directly the hormone yeah. with a peripheral so, receptor. So I think. I, I think it's reasonable to think that we're, we, we're intervening with a major endocrine function, okay? There's going to be the bad effects and the good effects. Yeah. And I agree that we don't know enough about them. But le let me tell you what we're trying to do. So we, we look at the women in our study, the centenarians, right, that have the lower IGF versus the high IGF. And the first thing that we're worried is about the brain, okay, the cognitive function. The women with the lowest level of IGF have amazingly better uh, cognitive function. Um, so they're not paying by the brain. In other words, the effect of low IGF on aging is much more important for whatever circulating IGF could do in other ways. And then we looked at muscle function, you know, grip and chair and everything like that. And they're similar. In other words, it's not better, but they didn't pay back pay for the fact that IGF-1 level was lower in those people. So we, we have to really understand better what's I, low IGF-1 bet for, and I think it's probably the worst for bone more than anything else, and what low IGF-1 is good for in prevention major diseases. What are the major living problems that centenarians have. I mean, what, what, what is it that they find hardest in life? I'm not talking so much about the physical illness. You know, uh, Luigi talked about personality and attitude. So I'll, I'll answer, I don't know to answer what you're saying exactly, but we looked at their personality and we published three papers showing that they, they have great uh, personality. They're extrovert, they're positive, they're optimistic and uh, they don't say anything r wrong about their daughter-in-law and things like that. And, 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 and of course, the question is, is it association or is it causation? So let me tell you uh, just this little story of a 104-year-old guy that I went to see, and I sat with him, and he was the nicest guy I've ever met. He was so good and so considerate, and everybody was important, and he tells me, about his life, it was just a, a, a complete person. Now, I go out of the room and I bumped into his son, who's 82 years old, right? And I say, and I tell him, you know, your father was amazing. 
And he looks me in my eyes and said, you should have seen a son of a bitch when he was my age. He was terrible. <laughs> and then you realize that we say personality doesn't change, uh, and, may, and maybe until age 70 there was some event, but I'm telling you, when you live long enough, personality change. In fact, you know, in University of Pennsylvania, they took young and old people, and they showed them good slides, like uh, islands in Hawaii, and bad slides, like uh, pizza with cockroaches, okay? And they showed them many slides, and the people had to recall. And the young people recall both the bad and the good. The old people recalled only the good. By the way, I'm looking forward this straight. <laughs> but, but I think there is a physiology, and the physiology tends for people, when they live long enough, to be more <laughs> adaptable and reasonable and optimistic, maybe because they've lived so many years. Uh, here, use this, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you, act, you actually opened up the door to a second question I wanted to have. My first question is you, you showed four groups, the uh, Icelandic people and the age age and so forth. I assume you were just intimating that these are groups that are easy to study because of commonality of genetics as opposed to these groups actually have a higher probability of living longer. No, a actually the Amish, the Amish is true, but the CHS study is white people with diversity genetics, Irish, Italians, uh, Jewish. <laughs> okay, uh, and the second point which you, which you opened up the door to, and, and this, is, this goes to both, speak, both speakers today, is the whole emotional, psychological, spiritual impact on longevity. And intuitively, I feel that that might be a factor because we talk often about the, the mind body interface and the psychology you know, how the mind controls our physiology and you refer to maybe the the older people have a more upbeat personality or more extroverted or came to the realization that there's no long there's no use to being bitter or to be a crotchety old guy once you get to be past 82 there's no need to be crotchety you can be nice and then live longer not quite both speakers. Luigi, uh, you want? Well, I, I, I will tell you that uh, uh, Luigi, the, the, the DLSA uh, has done a number of studies on personality and uh, using the NEO that was actually created uh, for the DLSA. And, and there's a number of uh, effects that, uh, you know, positive traits of personality have in prevention of depression. This seems to be with... Uh, associated with the lower risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, lower metabolic effect, uh, seems to be less associated, for example, with the metabolic syndrome. So I think that the brain-body association is really, really strong. Now, I think that, that uh, uh, Neil is right in saying that when you reach extreme longevity, probably there may be change in personality. And I had direct experience of talking to many, many centenarians. When I was uh, at the beginning of my career, an interviewer in the Sardinia study, and I can tell you that most of those that were not sick were incredible and extraordinary people. But, but, but up to the old, old age, personality really does not change. I think that it's a trait that, that developed in extremely old age. So let me ask both of you. Both of you showed like Gaussian population curves, right? So the implication is that the people over the age of 100 are just uh, the lower part of a statistically Gaussian curve. Is that correct? Or are they really an entity unto themselves? I mean, the, the, the the Gompers curve that say that, uh, you know, the increase in mortality is geometric uh, according to age uh, has been uh, shown to be violated in very, very old age. And the force of mortality tend to fade and the extreme longevity probably because there is a selection of individual. And so the increase is not as proportional when you go beyond the yeah. age of 95. So I don't think that this is just the tail of the distribution. I think that uh, there is a survival effect uh, 
uh, that is due to something where that we don't know, maybe IGF-1 or maybe some other combination of gene or maybe is gene environmental interaction. I don't know, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally support it. I, I think, you know, I think we cannot, uh, the, the demographer and us don't totally agree on many things. For example, the demographer says, longevity will continue straight through. And we biologists think there's actually a roof for every species. You know, I mean, we know that people can, the oldest old was 122, but somewhere as a species, uh, we, we probably have a limit. And to get over the, so how, how do we get a bit better health span in this limit is what's very important for us rather than for now trying to find out if we can break the limit later on by some regeneration and stuff like that. But I, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, but I'm saying that Gaussian for me doesn't mean that those guys at the tip of the Gaussian are not special, right? It doesn't, well, it doesn't want to contradict. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, here, would you pass that back, please? <coughs> Um, the, the reason why I'm here is because I'm, I'm I'm from the general public. I'm not a geneticist. I don't belong to NIH. Nothing. Okay. Um, I am on the board of of something called Village of Tacoma, and there are a lot of Village of Georgetown, Village of Dupont, and it's neighbors helping neighbors. Okay. So it's uh, people helping other people to get to the doctor, get get to the to the uh, to church, get to choir practice, whatever. Um, and that part of it, what a lot of people I've identified is the, the, the depression that comes from isolation of people who are older and living alone or can't get out or whatever. What I saw I'm in the, one of the slides of the, um, the video that you had of the gentleman, what I saw in his office was that a part of his environment was a huge bulletin board filled with uh, photographs of family members, friends, everything. And all along his uh, bureau, there were photos of friends all over the place. And he's working with his son. He's working with his grandson. And I'm kind of wondering if, if, if uh, sociability <laughs> is really one of the things that lead to longevity. And um, maybe even as organizations like ours develop more and people, neighbors are helping neighbors, that people will be living longer because we're helping them psychologically. I would say just one thing. Right. You can be extremely social and die of cancer at the age of 60, okay? I, I mean, uh, what, what, we're, what we're showing here is people with extreme, in extreme age, and they are what they have. They have, you know, a lot of the, the centenarians have lost their kids, actually, okay? Uh, so. I, I'm talking about a very unique uh, situation, so I don't want you to read too much into that. I, I agree that social thing is very important to aging. I mean, Luigi, maybe you want to put, but I don't want you to think that I showed you um, really a rationale to say that this guy and his family live to be uh, 110 because of social interactions. Okay, I think, yes. One of the things that I observed many times is that the uh, centenarian has uh, the awareness of being special, the awareness uh, of being survivors, the awareness of having uh, a memory of history that nobody else has, and that involved their family. So in general, I will say that uh, the centenarian I've been in contact with uh, have a very, very strong social context. But I'm not really sure that uh, whether this is this cause of context, probably more concept than cause. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, being social, maintaining a strong social ties and interaction is not fundamental for maintaining quality of life with aging and has incredibly extraordinary effect on your health. You know, it's absolutely important. We have shown that many times that, you know, other people with a strong larger neck do not develop the depression. They, they do, but even if they do, 
the consequence of depression in them when there is a social network around is much less. They are able to overcome the traumas that occur in life, such as disease or disease of the death of somebody that is close to them. So absolutely, I think that I, I said that at the beginning of my slide, this will require an entire different story. I think that creating the ties that allow you to be well in old age, it's something that you should start preparing when you're 30. Okay, well, I want to thank both of you very much for... Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you all for being here.